your dreams are dreams sexual? I certainly hope so. Joining Gail Delaney is Dr. Milton Kramer, who is the director of sleep disorders, uh, the Sleep Disorders Center at the Cincinnati General Hospital in Ohio, and director of the Dream Sleep Lab at the Cincinnati VA Hospital. He is one of the foremost authorities in this country on the subject, and he too claims that the dreams we have affect our daily life and also affect our moods all through the day. So here as we enter the twilight zone, the shank of the evening as it were, we will ramble through for a chance to dream with uh, Gail Delaney and uh, Dr. Milton Kramer. Now a little bit later on we have a gentleman joining us, uh, Mr. Hans Jurgen Sieberberg, who is the writer and director of what is shaping up to be one of the most talked about motion pictures of the year. This past Sunday, Avery Fisher Hall here in New York was filled to capacity with an audience that came to see Mr. Sieberberg's film, which is entitled Our Hitler, a film from Germany. It's a cinch it wouldn't be from Spain, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> What is astonishing about this picture is that, is that it runs for, for seven and a half hours. Give me a break, seven and a half hours. But as he says, it takes a long time to tell the story. Show for tonight. Just like eating Brussels sprouts tonight, you know. It'll get going here after we take the first bite. <laughs> that, or, did you ever have lima beans? When I was a kid in kindergarten, I went to kindergarten, Miss Bibbinger and Miss Bradbury at Garden Home School back in Wisconsin. A German neighborhood. We were told in kindergarten not to turn the light off, but to make the light out. Mach and see das Licht auf, okay? Make the light off. Um, the department store was down by where the streetcar bends the corner around. It was that kind of a neighborhood. And as our first project, she said, uh, Miss Bibbinger and Miss Bradbury said, Today, boys and girls, we are all going to make something to eat. We are going to teach you how to grow things that you will be able to eat so that you learn the value of productivity. So they went all through the class, and I guess Virginia got to grow a little orange tree, and Bobby got to grow some strawberries, and, and Randy got to do the lettuce. Well, when they got down to me, they said, and Tommy, you're... Re now here's Gail Delaney, a dream psychologist, the author of a book which is called Living Your Dreams, and Dr. Milton Kramer, who is the director of the, sleep, the Dream Sleep Lab at the Cincinnati, Ohio Veterans Administration Hospital, and director of the Sleep Disorders Center at the Cincinnati General Hospital. Do we know what causes dreams, and I don't mean why we have them, but how we're able to see things while we're sleeping? Why does that happen? Is, is it chemicals? You would know, probably. Well, it's probably it's physiological. Since I don't. Yeah, one of the things that happens is that that part of the brain, at a physical level, that has to do with, uh, with vision, the occipital cortex, is actually stimulated periodically during the night and probably is the substrate, the, the physical base for uh, for the uh, visual imagery mm -hmm. because that's where the signals that you if you were awake and looking that's where the signals would end up would be in the occipital cortex what do you both think are the most important things we learn from dreams shall i take it first yes please <laughs> i think that our dreams every night are trying to solve the problems we confront every day now they may be personality problems maybe relationship problems work related issues or creative problems and that's, to me, the most exciting thing about dreams. Yeah, but what if your dreams that you have at night don't have anything to do with what happened to you that whole preceding day? You know what I mean? Because that's happened to all of us. It, it's nothing to do with what happened yesterday. They may not look like they have something to do with what happened yesterday, but they usually do. You simply need to understand the language of your dreams, which is symbol and metaphor. It's not words. How far along are we? in really understanding what dreams are, and in, in, well, in breaking, or breaking the code well, of dreams, as it were. If you look at it from the point of view that Gail's talking about it, which is to make it useful in a therapeutic or growth self-development sense, I think it becomes a very useful device. If you look at it from the point of view that those of us who are running sleep laboratories and doing work at that level, we've never been able to demonstrate systematically a function for dreaming. I mean, the two large... Mm -hmm scientific research questions are to develop a systematic method of what does the dream mean and a systematic method as to what difference does it make and we've not but that's a different question Tom really than the ones and that is can I take that experience and make it useful there are many experiences you have in life that are useful as the Dickens but you, you put them to use you make them work for you and even though they're not intended for that purpose. Are dreams ever, from the experiences both of you have had, are they ever warnings of things to come? That you know, we've all heard the stories. I dreamed last night that my uncle died, and two days later, he did. 
there are accounts of that that have persisted through the decades. And the most recent one that most of us have heard about was the fellow who had the dream of the American Airlines crash. Before it happened, he called American Airlines and said, can you do anything and what could they do? He didn't know what flight it would be, et cetera, and the, and the crash happened in May. It does happen, it's fairly rare, and the, mis the difficulty would be to think that all of your dreams are predicting some future event. It's very unusual. And if, I suppose if a person felt that the dream was a prediction of something to come, you could drive yourself a little bit fruitcake. You know, I, I won't cross that street, I won't eat at this restaurant, I won't go in that building, and I'm not getting on that airplane. You could go a little bonkers. Exactly. Huh? Well, they tried that, you know, when they had the Lindbergh kidnapping, and they, they went out to the public at large and said, if anybody dreams about where the Lindbergh baby is, please let us know. And there was, it was not useful. There, no one was able to help find the dead Lindbergh infant or using dream, dream techniques to, to identify where the person is. But about, in a modern American city, 5% of the people believe that dreams foretell the future. If you do a systematic sampling. So there's a significant portion of our population that are really persuaded whether we have the evidence for it or not is another, another question. Now, you have a theory which I've heard uh, espoused before, that we can order up dreams. Before we go to sleep at night, we can order up exactly what we want to experience, what we want to see, what we gonna, what want to feel except that yours is different from the one I heard before. The yes. other one was if you just think about it for a half an hour before you go to sleep, it'll happen for you. And I can tell you that doesn't work because I think about no. it for about three hours before I go to sleep. Yeah, usually doesn't that happen. doesn't work very well. But what I think you can do and what's a fairly easy feat for most people to accomplish is to pick a problem in their life, a personal problem or a professional problem, how to make your marriage work, or what to do next in your career, what options are open to you that you haven't recognized. You can ask questions like that, and you can get a dream that will treat the question. It's much more difficult to go to sleep and say, tonight I will dream of being on the Riviera and I will be dancing with a lovely lady. That's a very difficult process to initiate, and a lot less useful than actually picking a part of your life that's not going as well as you would like it, and asking for a dream to help you to solve that problem. So before you go to sleep at night, you write it down. Yes. What you do is you choose your problem first off and you take a notepad. Let's say a career problem. Why am I not okay. doing well in my career? Okay. All right. That's a very good question. Certainly very is. Very direct it's and you take one, responsibility for it. One I think it. about probably <laughs> every night before I go to bed. All right. So now take your notepad to bed with you mm -hmm. and write down the date. Then write down a few lines about what you did and what you felt today. That warms you up. Then no, write it down. Gets me mad. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm but then that I'm warms you up. Then write down a few lines about your problem, some of your frustrations at work, some of your aspirations. Get the chitter chatter that's usually in your mind out onto the paper. Then the most important step, if you forget the first two, is to write down your question. What's your question? I don't want to say my question here. Okay, well, the one we just used then is... Why are things going so poorly at the office? Or why can't I get a promotion? Right. Why doesn't the boss like me? Why won't he call exactly. me? Why doesn't put, he talk to me? You put the question into your own why, words. Why doesn't he answer my letters? Why, do, why is he torturing me? All those things. But why am I not doing better in my work? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Write that down. Make it a one-line question. And then turn out the light. And as you go to sleep, and this is the most important step, Repeat that question over and over again, and every time your mind wanders to, will this work, or that terrible boss, all those worry thoughts, those are what Or that lady on the Riviera that I want to dance with. Yeah. Exactly. Tonight, you're just going to focus on that one question. Repeat it over and over again like a mantra or a lullaby, and you'll find yourself falling asleep very quickly. Then when you wake up, whether that's in the middle of the night or in the morning, write down whatever's on your mind. And it may be a whole dream, it may be a fragment of a dream, it may be just the good idea, or a title of a song. Write it down, then have breakfast, then come back and look over your dream account and see if you can find the parable or the metaphor in the dream account that answers your dream. I'll give you an example. Okay. Okay. One of my Before you give me an example, yeah? and I know that you'll be gentlemanly about this, but you are you are the medical side of dreams. You have credentials, you are the hospitals in Cincinnati. You've heard this. Is there credence in what the lady says? I don't think you have to go, go to, I think there's credence in the sense that if you could relax enough to let your mind wander freely, you can develop responses in yourself as you're sensitive, as much as you'd like to pretend, and I think Gail's book suggests this, that you don't know why the boss is mad at you, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. You do have a sense of, you know, if you'd stop screwing up, he would, 
you know, he wouldn't be so mad, or something that could be altered, and you get clues and responses that I think are useful, and we have a lot of it. The difficulty is when you're trying to do it over large populations systematically, then you don't have these marvelous anecdotes that are, are so compelling. Because you see, you have 100 to 150,000 dreams in a lifetime. And uh, where you're not, uh, and most of them you don't recall, overwhelmingly. You know, if you recall 4,000 dreams in a lifetime, you've got a very, very unusual uh, category of dreams to, to work with. So the question for someone like me becomes is, what is all that mentation doing without you reworking it? Gale's procedure requires, think about it, remember your dream, try to understand it, try to translate it into useful language. Mm -hmm. My interest is, what is all that mentation doing that you're not aware of? How does spontaneous that... process yes. is what you're talking yeah. about. And I'm so, talking about a more manipulated process. Mm -hmm. Where well, you're really trying to make it work for you, where yes. you're taking to what you know you do well, mm -hmm. whatever, and say, well, let's maximize it. Let's try to make me a better tennis player, a more sensitive person, whatever it is. Yeah. So I think you can relate the two, but my interest is different, and I, I think what Gail is talking about is an interaction between waking and dreaming. I'm more interested in dreaming as a process, per se. Mm -hmm. Now to the example that okay, you were about to give. Okay, now one example. A woman named Nina was a client of mine and had a very difficult relationship with a fellow named George. The most popular issue to incubate a dream on or ask for specific help from a dream is your love life and your work life. And here, we talked about work, here's love. And so Nina asked for a dream that would tell her, where is my relationship with George going? She repeated that phrase over and over again as she fell asleep. And she had the following dream. In the dream, George came up to her and said, Nina, come with me on a voyage. And she said, well, what's the name of the ship? And he said, it's the Titanic. Now, as Milt just said and suggested, the dream went on and showed Nina why that relationship was doomed showed her his drinking, his gambling, all the things her friends might have been able to tell her, but that she would not recognize or confront. In her own experience, her dream was trying to say, look, feel this. And the dreams will often hit you at a gut level where you recognize what you could have known before, but for all practical purposes did not. Because in our dream states, we are more relaxed, it seems, we're more intuitive, we're more objective about our life situation. And the conscious mind is not blocking out the drinking it's problem, the drug problem, the, uh, the excessive spending or whatever it and might be. And you're not be. going over with the same cycles of old thoughts about the problem, those thoughts that have not solved the problem yet. We have some very famous examples, Mahatma Gandhi, for instance, and this is Martin Luther King Day, almost, just passed, and, uh, and the whole issue of nonviolent protest. Well, Mahatma Gandhi had a great difficulty in the 40s with India. He was, of course, agitating for independence. And the English passed an act essentially forbidding all public demonstration that would agitate toward independence. And so Mahatma Gandhi went to sleep asking for a good idea and a dream. What can I do that won't get people shot and arrested and still move toward independence? And he came up with the idea of the Hartal, which was the nonviolent strike where people were told to stay home and go t and pray, but not to go to work, not Luther to King's make the country line. work. I had a dream. Exactly. I, so have, it's a, I have a commercial. We will continue after these announcements now from the NBC television stations. Enjoy old world grandeur and... <laughs> now, we're that's what, that's we're what back we're now with Gail Delaney and Dr. Milton Kramer. At the, uh, at the Center for Sleep Disorders, and the uh, Dream Center at the VA Hospital. What do you do there? Do you watch people sleeping? Yes, we have, we have a laboratory where people come in and we're able to identify a period during sleep when they're dreaming. We wake them up and we systematically collect their dreams. And in contrast to the kind of interesting selective dream that, that uh, Gail gets to hear, if, you, if we take the hundreds and hundreds of dreams from a subject that we collect and have you read them, it's the absolute cure for insomnia. They're dull, they're boring. They unfortunately mirror the life that most of us have, which is kind of a dull, mundane... Dull lives produce dull, dull dreams? dreams. And unfortunately, I think that characterizes more of life than most of us would like to uh, admit. Some of the things that we've been into that are, I think, of some interest and related to the personal relationships that Dr. Delaney were talking about is the difference between male... the dream content of uh, men and women, mm -hmm. which has been a, a topic of enormous interest, particularly at a time now where we think that the concept male and female is changing in our society. The, uh, we've done some work, as have others, like Calvin Hall, 
where the stereo classical stereotypes about men and women men are more active women are passive uh, men dream about women women dream about men and women they they seem to have a, a broader range of, of interest is it what you said just true men dream about women men dream about women oh I don't think so I've had some dreams about uh, you know guys on golf courses and uh, in railroad cars and stuff like that uh, would they dream so uh, gr in numbers you're more likely to dream about women so if we take True. a thousand of your dreams uh, given the fact that you're more or less like the rest of us um, there will be more women in your dreams than men on a proportion basis what if there are more men than women then do I have a problem you're different than other people Okay. <laughs> which is something that uh, your your crew seems to want to respond to <laughs> but there are now we're, we're into something that's kind of interesting and that is we've just done a rather large sample we've studied two thousand dreams from uh, a group of men and women that we collected systematically in the laboratory and the male female difference that has been published in non-laboratory studies we're having a great deal of trouble finding we have some much smaller differences and not and in areas for example women's dreams are more intense than men's dreams but now, the, can you define intensity of a dream oh well yeah for example to say fast makes a dream in other words if the descriptions have adjectives which have intensity implications fast would be more intense than slow tall would be counted in our system as more intense mm -hmm. than short mm -hmm. uh, a bright color would be more intense than a, a a neutral color all right so it's that way that you sort of have the the kind of way that you might want to liven up your language by using uh, you know uh, uh, intense phrases to sort of you know jazz it up a little bit well we weren't able to find the the strong male female differences but we think that it's a function of recall that part of what happens out of a much more similar total dream experience is that the last dream of the night there are more differences and it's that dream that you tend to recall so if if we would look at the last dream that you had in the laboratory and then at the sample of your spontaneously recalled dreams those are more alike and a lot of the duller stuff occurs earlier in the night is not too different than a social relationship what if you don't want a dream to answer a question you just want to have some fun dreaming is there any way to order that up yes it's possible it's more difficult for instance I can go to sleep and almost any night ask for a dream where I dance with Fred Astaire one of my favorite things to do and I almost always get a response where I dance with Fred Astaire though I don't know what the environment will be like it may be on the ocean or sometimes on the tip of a wing or sometimes in a beautiful ballroom but that takes a lot more practice and I'm not quite sure what it is that makes some people able to do it and others not. It's much easier for most people to have a dream on a specific topic. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to bring up the question of dull dreams. I think that dull, of course, is a, is a decision we make. We call this dream dull because we see the imagery. Now, if you were to see the dream of a woman who said, I look through this telescope, and every time I look through, it shorted out on me. When other people look through the telescope, it didn't short out. End of dream. That could be considered dull. But if you're working on a one-to-one -one basis, which is different from the dream lab situation, I would ask the person, well, what is a telescope? And, well, the dreamer might say, and in this case, one dreamer said to me, it's, it's to take the long view to see really into the distance. And, in fact, this dreamer had incubated a dream and asked, how does the way I see myself differ from how others see me? And for her, this was a very exciting dream, but you'd have to be able to talk to her about it to find that mm -hmm. out, because this dreamer was four foot seven and very tiny she's a, a grown woman with children growing up and she wanted to get back into the workforce and she had had a lot of difficulty finding a job she would like etc and so when she asked the question how does the way she see herself different from how others see her she had a dream where every time she looked through the, te the telescope it kept shorting out when other people looked through that was no problem and she woke up from that dream when her child was crying and she thought you know i think my shortness is something I worry about a lot more than other people. The dream has made that obvious to me. And now when I think of shorting out, I've been pulling myself out of the competition of a whole lot, a whole range of jobs, because I've assumed if I go in for an interrupt, for but, an interview, but, but, they but, but, won't pay but, attention to me. But do you help her interpret it that way? Does it, she, no, does, th in this particular case, the dreamer told me the whole dream. She had the entire feeling of it when she woke up. 
And she said, I didn't know I still was so hung up about my shortness. But don't most people need a you or a her or a somebody to, uh, that after you, you tell them what the know, dream is? Haven't you, ever, you know, I can remember with a, a, an old friend of mine, we went to New Orleans and we came back and he told stories about our trip. And I was there. Mm -hmm. And it took me a while to realize, as he was telling it in this exciting, interesting, humorous way, that I was there at the time <laughs> it happened. <laughs> and I would argue, that, see, that's not the dream experience. That if I'm, I'm a clever, insightful guy, as my friend, who now is a physician in Israel, is, he takes what is a mundane experience and reworks it with his clever, imaginative, responsive self and enlivens it and becomes an artist, really, in a way. While uh, but as an experience. But whose see. perceptive mechanisms decide the nature of the experience, well, as I, dull or interesting? Well, I think if you take a hundred people... That's true. If say, we go by the majority, yeah, I agree and, with you. And we, we do that. And you see, they're not even that interesting. What they are is, I had coffee this morning. I smoked a cigarette. I had I the greatest cup of coffee when I got up this morning and smoked three cigarettes that were absolutely delicious. I couldn't believe it. They were so great. <laughs> And I think you're off on your way to Israel with my friend. <laughs> <laughs> but the question was, do most of us need somebody to interpret what those dreams are? That we tell them to you or we tell them to Gail, and they say, well, now, here's what it could mean. Or can we do it ourselves? I think you can do it yourself in, the, in this interpretive, you know, sense. Uh, you can learn to do and it I, yourself. And I think Gail mm -hmm. suggests that in her book rather clearly. You, you, you need to get the knack of seeing pictures as meaningful, as a poet might see a poem. And when we heard the Titanic dream, you and I interpreted that dream quickly. We did go through an interpretive process. We said, what's the Titanic? Well, it's a ship that's doomed. We all do that. And there, that picture was easy. Our other dreams can be interpreted on the same way. Life is the Titanic. It might be for you. I hope it's not. <laughs> no, but uh, the Titanic only went down once. I do it four or five times a week. You know, right? so we're up to the water line here. Let's get out of here. Now, let me ask you this. You said that you wanted to, uh, like, you, you could uh, sometimes dream that you were dancing with Fred Astaire. And my question really is to Dr. Milton. Do you think that women tend to dream more of that sort of thing and that men tend to dream more about sexual matters when it comes to women? Hmm. Well, the difficulty with sexual dreams is that it depends many times a dream which is manifestly sexual uh, in terms of overt activity hasn't got a damn thing to do with sex that the issue are issues of power or issues issues of care that have that are not sexual and and in the interpretive sense that Gail was talking about it the reworking of it into uh, uh, sort of well what does the symbol mean can undo and make a much more uh, manifestly sexual experience in terms of manifest reporting uh, women are more are less likely to report sexual dreams than men are, and uh, but I mean you know when guys dream they they have erections you know they, that's pretty well documented but, that all males you know, even little baby ones have that when they when they have REM sleep not when they dream because uh, rapid eye movement yeah you know. because you see the the newborn doesn't have the mechanism for dreaming as an elaborated visual event so that the erection may not be sexual. The erection is, an autom is a generalized autonomic response. We can use that response where for men who have uh, impotence to try to help them to understand, is it a psychological impotence where they would continue to have these erections during the sleep cycle? Or is it a physical impotence where they are physically incapable of getting mm -hmm. erection? We, they sleep in the laboratory. Why does that happen to us when we sleep? There's I'm not sure the sense in which you mean why. Why it's, do men get erections during rapid eye movement? We don't know. What uh -huh. we know is that there's a general... And it's a hell of a question, isn't it? It's a great question. Are we it, researching that? Yes. My, <laughs> I would uh, hope so. It's being researched as a matter of because of the concern about uh, 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 Vietnam veterans and some of the problems that uh, men in general have. A major center for it is at the VA hospital in Houston, Texas, where... Uh, Dr. Karajan and his staff, who have uh, studied this very intensely, and are working with surgeons to do corrective procedures for uh, men who uh, who have physical impotency problems, mm -hmm. rather than psychological ones. So this work is is going on, but I think that the differential recall problem and the fact that when you alter the quality of your sleep, in other words, if you sleep more lightly, you're more likely to remember dreaming. And uh, there are things which, a number of things, which uh, can affect uh, dreams and sleep in various ways. And uh, 
those of us active in the sleep field have tried to put together some material on that and, and make it more generally available. Do you want to add anything to that discussion? No, I think it was beautifully said. Okay. What about all the songs? You stepped out of a dream. I had a dream, dear. You had one, too. Mine I can was... dream, can't I? Yeah. I mean, how we have mystified dreams and really made them something in pop culture that they're not, huh? Yes, we've made them something that has to do with certainly wish fulfillment, in some people's mind exclusively that, rather than problem solving, which is at least one possible function of dreaming. And we see them as fantasy, oh, he's a dreamer. What a dream boat. And yet, then you think of Martin Luther King, and he had a dream. A dream can be an inspiration. And one thing I found most exciting about working with dreams is working with people, scientists, who are involved with creative problem solving, who have to come up with a new pressure gauge for the Apollo project, and who go to sleep with the problem on their mind and wake up with the the program written out so they can figure out how to make this pressure gauge. Mm -hmm. Our M9 gun directors came out of a, a dream of an electric engineer in Bell Labs during the 40s that shot down all the buzz bombers over uh, <laughs> the Second Battle of Britain. But before I leave here, when you wake up these people when they're having the dream, do they, do they ever get mad that you woke them up? They, it's an annoying experience yeah, no. and uh, a little bit, but we're dealing with volunteers or people who have problems, so they, they want to be there mm -hmm. for one reason or another. But over a protracted period, after the 20th night of that, you've really had enough. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you want a break. Doctor, thank you for being with us tonight. Dr. Milton Kramer from Cincinnati and uh, Gail, thank you for being here with us. Gail Delaney, thank whose book so. is called Living Your Dreams. Could be our dreams, but in this case, it's your dreams. Thank you both very much. We will meet... with Tom Arnold. Have you ever had a dream later that later came true? Well, Tom Arnold, he had one of those dreams. And we've got a dream analyst here today who's going to help us all figure out what our dreams really mean and how to make them work for you. Please welcome Dr. Gail Delaney. You're welcome. Now, Dr. Delaney has written, I believe, something like 10 dream books. Is that Seven. correct? Seven mm -hmm. dream books, wow. close enough. You've got a book here that is... Yes, my latest baby. And it's called... In Your In Dreams. In Your Dreams. Well, I've heard that before. Yeah. <laughs> now, we thought somebody would have said that. Yeah. Well, obviously, analyzing dreams is important. So what, Tom, Tom, have you had a dream that she could probably... Analyze? Yeah, I've had a few, but uh, did you dream that hat up for... No, it's very beautiful. I just got... Uh, no, it looks nice. Oh. Oh, I, uh, that. I want to personally apologize for Tom Arnold. <laughs> I don't know. I take it as a compliment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> See? Now, I had a dream. When I was uh, first started right out of high school, I worked in the meatpacking plant. And, yeah. and uh, I thought my grandpa had worked there 50 years. I thought I was going to be there 50 years. And it was kind of depressing. There's no windows. And, you know, there's a lot of uh, death and blood around and everything. And I was having this dream. Uh, Mork and Mindy just come on the air. And I had this dream <laughs> that I was, like, uh, in Hollywood. And I'd always dreamed of that as a kid. I was like best friends with Rob Williams, and the dream was so real that when I'd wake up in the morning at 4.30 to go to work, I, it took me a little while to come out of it, and then I'd be so depressed, because there I'd be in my little apartment, going to work at the meatpacking plant, and I had this dream for three years, over and over, and then I just willed myself to stop dreaming it, because it was too, too devastating for it not to be true. And then uh, if I, through a series of breaks, getting fired for public nudity, et cetera, et cetera, I ended up in Hollywood, and I did a movie with Robin Williams, nine months, and got to hang out with him and get to know him, and it was so weird, it was great. Now, what, Dr. Delaney, what does that dream represent? There are two represent? ways to look at this kind of dream. One, that it inspired you. Even though you said it was too terrible to be disappointed, it was an image you had. It gave you a sense of yourself as being somebody who'd be on a par with Robin Williams. Another possibility is it's a psychic dream, that it is a dream that you know about your future, but then you also had to work to make it come true. You didn't just say, oh, great, I had the dream and that's my life. Mm -hmm. You had to move toward it. So dreams are goals as well as wishes. So, what, Dr. Delaney, what about dreams where I, th I think probably all of us have had those horrible dreams, uh, plane crashes, falling off a building, but we catch ourselves, or I have done this so many times in a terrible dream, to catch myself before the final act and I wake up. Now, falling dreams are the most common dreams in the world. We've all had them of falling. Most of us do wake up just before we hit the bottom. Usually those dreams come at a time in our lives when we're scared about losing control or we're going to lose a job or we're going to lose something very important to us. And we fear that that's the end. The dream expresses your fear, your hope, 
also some of your best problem-solving skills, but in this case, it's your fear. Aren't some of them just dreams, though, you know? <sighs> just a dream. Just, what they we, all mean something. Yeah, all our dreams mean something in that they express how we feel, how we really think in yeah. an honest way. Yeah, you go to bed at night and you're thinking about a, a show you're writing right. or directing the next day and you probably think about it or dream about it all night long. Yeah. I, I want to surprise you. A lot of my books are used at Stanford School of Business and other schools of business around the world. Why? Because we do some of our best problem solving in our sleep. We go to sleep with a problem on our mind and often wake up in the morning with a re say, resolution. A lot of you have had that experience, yeah. right? People say sleep on it. Yeah, that's right. Sleep Dream on, on it. it, I suppose. Mm -hmm. And we can give people instructions on how to do that tonight. You want to just try that real quickly? I'll try it. All right. Yeah, really... Let's say, let's say that you've got a problem in your life, how to get along better with your husband. Is your marriage going to make it? Is this boyfriend worth it? Um, I need a new idea for something at work, for a project I'm working on. How I can I get along problems. better with my it's boss? It's going to be a busy night. <laughs> all right, pick one. Write that question down before you go to sleep. I need a new idea for such and such, or how can I get along better with so and so? Turn out the light, repeat that question over and over as you fall asleep. And when you wake up in the morning, write down whatever's on your mind and it'll usually be an answer to your question. And we can do this. This is a natural problem-solving function of your dreaming. What, what about when you lay down at night? I, I'm not a sick person, but I, I, I think about horses. I, I lay down at night and dream about this great, no, 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 I'm in the horse business, but I don't have a great stallion, and I literally think, lay in bed at night and go to sleep with this great stallion on my mind. Now, this has not come true yet. That's about your life, about your work. So you're dreaming about, you're wanting to dream about a stallion. You already know you need a, a great stallion in your collection, right? Right. All right, so you don't need to dream on it. Your dreams take you the next step. Oh, okay. Your dreams look at what are you not figuring out? Where are you stuck? And the dream helps you figure out the next step. Okay, well, Dr. Delaney, our next step is we're going to give our audience out here an opportunity to kind of add, ask you what their dreams mean. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. We'll be right back, sir. Don't go away. Hi, and welcome back to Weekday for this Thursday, November 8th. I'm Ricky Stevenson, filling in for Mary Lou Manali. Well, despite reports that the economy is on on the men, there are more people out of work unemployed today than at any other time since the Great Depression. What impact is this having on the minds of Americans, people who are used to a prosperous lifestyle? We'll hear from Dr. Loma Flowers, Assistant Professor of Psychiatry at the University of California on that topic. Also with us today on weekday is Dr. Gail Delaney, a dream expert and president of the Association of the Study of Dreams. It's her contention that we can solve many of our personal problems and our career dilemmas as well as we direct our career paths if we study what we dream at night. Doctors Flowers and Delaney, thank you for being with me on a, a weekday. Dr. Flowers, let me start with you. How are people reacting to the current economy? I find that people are en enduring a lot more stress than they have in the past. And in terms of their careers, they're often forced to leave when they don't wish to, and they have unexpected unemployment. And they will often be able to um, stay in a particular job that they would rather not and they even have to transfer to a job that they don't wish to have, a demotion, uh, because they're unable to take the risk of leaving that job and searching around in a way that they might if the economy was more secure. Mm -hmm. And people are coming to you in increased numbers? Uh, yes, there's no question that I'm, I'm busy in my particular practice, but there's also the problem that psychiatry, uh, which is my profession, private practice, is a very expensive uh, field so that a number of people can no longer afford the medical care that they might have. So a number of people are having to leave their therapy um, that they would prefer to stay with because of the economy, because of the lack of uh, health insurance benefits that also go when you lose, lose your job. And what happens to the general society as a result of all of this? 
I think that one finds that people are a lot more stressed, and the same stress as one has in career in general will come up more often and more frequently. Often you have a difficulty with career choices, changes in career, crises in your job, reorganizations, all those areas make stress for an individual as they go through their job and their life experience in the work market. And I think what's happening now is it happens to more people, it happens to more people in the same family, it may happen to the two people in the same couple simultaneously, so that the impact is perhaps twice what it might be if it was only one person or one relative and then the other relatives can perhaps help out. Mm -hmm. Now I know that you do group seminars with people, but are there, and we'll talk about that further, are there other ways that couples who are facing economic problems and maybe cannot get into a private psychiatrist or maybe can't even afford seminars are there things that they can do to recognize what's happening to them? Oh, I think definitely. And that's one of the ways that the dream work that uh, Dr. Delaney and I do together comes in. There's no question that one can use one's own dreams. Uh, one can work with a particular technique, such as Dr. Delaney's technique that she uh, wrote in her book, Living Your Dreams. And that people can read that and use that. It's very directive. It's a kind of uh, workbook, almost, of how one can work with your dreams and recognize in them basic information about your job, how, what kind of a decision to make. Should I leave this well-paying job now and go back to school when the economy is so bad? Should I uh, take this promotion? What is really going on and why am I having all these battles with my boss? Mm -hmm. How can I stand this job when I really can't afford to leave because I don't think I can get anything else? All right, Dr. Delaney, how can I use my dreams to direct where I need to go? Well, Ricky, you can start to recall your own dreams that you get spontaneously every night and write them down. You can also target your dreams. It's called incubating a dream. Let's say that you have a struggle. You're maybe in a new career. You've had to switch. You're changing. You're working hard at it, and nothing seems to be working, and the money isn't coming in. What you can actually do is ask for a dream tonight by writing down on a piece of paper before you go to sleep the question that's in your mind. In this case, the question might be, Am I sabotaging myself somehow? How come nothing seems to be working? I'm, I'm doing my best, but we don't seem to be getting results. You write down your question. Am I sabotaging myself? Mm -hmm. That might be your question. And when you turn out the light, you repeat the question over and over as you fall asleep. Now, you can ask any question as you fall asleep. Pick the one that best suits your problem. I had a client who did that, and she woke up with a dream with the same problem, and in her dream, she was up in a high place. She was afraid of heights. She was terrified and she would be talked down from this difficult position by an old friend in the family. Mm -hmm. And so I asked her, describe to me this old friend in the family. And she described a very kind, warm-hearted person who was an underachiever, to say the least. Very much of an underachiever. was talking her down. So I said, well, tell me. Pretend I come from another planet, which is Loma's and my method in working with mm -hmm. dreams. Pretend I've never heard of a fear of heights before. Tell me about it. She said, well, a fear of heights uh, is being afraid in high places. And she said, you know, I really am. I'm terrified of the criticism that I get when I'm in a high place, when mm -hmm. I'm out front. And this is a, a conflict many people have without knowing they have it. And the wonderful thing about the dream is that the dream is showing this dream where she has an, uh, an unexamined anxiety about being criticized, mm -hmm. shot down when she's up front, and she lets herself get talked down by her underachieving self. And the dreams will help you see a situation very clearly, very quickly. Well, okay. often, you know, it's interesting. I just wanted to add, when the high place <coughs> that um, this client was in in the dream is clearly not dangerous. Yeah. Okay. So it makes a clear distinction for you in your dream. Yes, it's high. You know, you may yes be your department chief, or you could move up and be the executive of the business, or you could even start your own business. But that's not necessarily dangerous. Mm -hmm. Okay, whereas one may be terrified, you recognize that the fear is irrational and that will often give you the courage to go ahead and risk it. Go for it, basically. Okay, how about someone who's unemployed and they're thinking, what do I do? All right, the question then is, do I know what career I want? Or well, let's, let's take that one. That's the most common one. I'm unemployed and I don't know which direction to turn in. You can ask for a dream that will help you see both what your basic desires are in work. You could ask, what do I need to get out of a job to be happy in the job? First, you get a general sense. And then you can look when you wake up, say, all right, these are my major needs. I need to be with people I like, for instance, and I need to feel a sense of achievement, whatever it comes up for you. The money. Uh, money, yes. yeah. Okay. The, the dreams will usually lay it out for you, so you see your priorities more clearly when you're asleep often than when you're awake. Mm -hmm. Then you wake up, you look at the world and see, well, here are the options. Here are the sorts of jobs that might give me that. I'm focused now. I can choose more clearly. And then you can go to sleep again and say, how about this sort of job? How would that satisfy my basic needs and skills? 
All right. I have, most of us do have, at, at, in our 30s, have serious career decisions to make. Definitely. Should you go on? What should you do? Families, that sort of thing. Yeah, we commonly um, work with that. Mm -hmm. I'm dreaming now myself about interviewing people and running after people. What, what would you tell me? What well, tell I wouldn't me? tell you anything before I asked you a lot of questions. So I'd want to know how the interviews go when you interview people. Are they famous people whom you would like to interview? How mm -hmm. would you answer those questions? I, I think uh, Jose Napoleon Duarte would be famous, uh -huh. and uh, Robert Mugabe, the president of Zimbabwe, would mm -hmm. be famous. All right. Are these people you admire? Yes. All right. M curious. Let's put well, it How do you way. feel about them? I feel like they have right now that they might serve as um, a mouthpiece for what's happening on the African continent in South America. Mm -hmm. it's Are those areas that you would like to work more with, not necessarily the men, but the areas? International reporting. Especially with African issues? Yes. All right, how about that? Would that be an idea? Would that give you extraordinary pleasure? And then would you do better at that than you would at anything else because you have a passion for it? So that's what I should come to the conclusion. Right, and those I are the kinds of questions do. that you would ask yourself as you were working with the dream. You need to, and when you have characters that you dream about in your dream, for example, if you dream about something at work and you dream about Mary who works at the next desk, okay, then you need to ask yourself what kind of a person Mary is. In the same way as, as Gail just asked you about what kind of characters were there that you were dreaming about. Because often the people that you dream about give you a clue as to some part of, of your life that you would like to do more in, some part of yourself perhaps, that's a little hard to recognize, particularly if it's a character you don't like very much, it's very hard to acknowledge those parts mm -hmm. of ourselves, mm -hmm. or parts of yourself that you say, oh no, I never have those, now, this is someone I admire tremendously, but it's nothing I could ever do. And again, it's very useful to know that there is perhaps a part of you that is like that, that is you, that you may not know very well, but is it there in your personality structure that you can call on as a resource when you go for a job interview when you're unemployed? How do I remember my dreams? How do people remember uh, their dreams when they wake up? The easiest way is before you go to bed at night to write down the date and one or two lines about what you did and what you felt today. That gets you all charged up. Keep then, a dream journal, for example, so that you don't lose the pieces of paper all over the house. That's mm -hmm. right. Keep it in a you know, good form of paper. And then when you wake up in the morning, you write down whatever is on your mind. Maybe just a little piece. You may just remember the name of someone you hadn't thought of for a long time. Those issues come out of dreams. Those images probably do come right out of your dreams. Soon you will have whole dreams to write down, but don't be afraid of writing down a little fragment because that often turns into a whole dream once you start actually telling it. Mm -hmm. It's quite how, easy to remember your dreams once you're intent How on about it. the terrible dreams that people have, the nightmares? They can be very useful. I, I was working with someone who had a nightmare that turned out to be about her job. She was on a retreat from her job with her boss in Yosemite, which should be a beautiful place for a relaxed, ideal, just her thing. She functions best with it's cool. And in the, what <coughs> happened was a stranger appeared and suddenly turned into a monster and began machine gunning everybody in the place. Oh my gosh. Exactly. Oh my <laughs> and then she's trying to get out of there and she said, I've got to get away from my boss because he's going to expect me to be able to capture this monster single-handedly. He's so naive he doesn't realize that that's ridiculous. I can't possibly do that. And she heads off, finds a friend, and off they go to safety. And when I asked her who was the friend, she said, the friend is very much like me, sort of fun and nice and, and pleasant, but she's much nicer than I am. I'm not so nice as she is. <laughs> and it turns out that for her, this monster is some reorganization plan that her boss has, that her boss feels that she's perfectly capable of handling and that for her, she's quite aware, is absolutely ridiculous to expect her to do that. Okay, now can we very simply, can, take me again through the incubation of a dream. What should I begin with? Okay, suppose tonight you would like a dream to help you explore a certain problem in your life. Mm -hmm. You take yes. your piece of paper and your pen mm -hmm. and you write down on the piece of paper, I want a dream to help me explore such and such a problem or I want a dream to help me to understand or solve such and such a problem. Right. I want to be confident when I go for my job interview tomorrow for instance. or when I ask the boss for a raise. All right, you can do that, projecting. Definitely. You certainly can. I want a dream to help me stop smoking. I mean, mm -hmm. you can get motivational dreams as well, a dream to give me confidence. Then you write down whatever it is your request turns out to be, turn out the light and immediately start repeating that phrase over and over again as you fall asleep. What you just wrote down, you repeat. You do not allow yourself to worry about the problem. You can do that when you're awake. This will help you to go to sleep. You can also ask if you want to, for the dream, if you're a beginner at this, to ask that the dream make it simple. I do that sometimes when I'm in a hurry and I don't want to spend half an hour figuring out what the dream ends. I want to make it obvious so that I understand it fairly quickly after I wake up. Okay, but then what is the resolution? I've written it down. I've repeated it. Now what do I do? What's the third step? 
you go to sleep and you can't help but go to sleep <laughs> because you get so bored repeating this phrase over <laughs> and over again. Yeah. Every time your mind wanders, you bring it back to the phrase so that that's the last thing on your mind as you fall asleep. And then when I wake up. You write down whatever is on your mind. You make no judgments about whether or not you were successful. If you're dreaming about chandeliers and giraffes, write it down. Yeah. You may not understand that you're having an interview with a famous person you admire has a lot to do about your finding out more about your own passions, interviewing your own passions in, in work. But I don't have you two to come to. Uh -huh. How am I going to analyze this? Okay, you take a look at each image and describe it. Describe the people, the things, the places in your dreams as if you were describing them to someone from another planet. All right, if you had a dream about me, I'd ask you, who's Gail? Tell me about it. Mm -hmm. Then you reflect back those same descriptions and see am I describing a part of myself or someone close to me or something I love or hate mm -hmm. and that's the basic one too that does take some practice but you can learn to do it on your own especially if you have the help of a friend it, it sounds simple it does take I think quite a lot of practice we've been teaching seminars on this now for quite a while and we find that people require a lot of uh, repeats and sometimes you know come back to the more advanced seminars so they can get a sense of how really to do it I would think that someone who is in business an engineer someone like that, yes. a physicist, mm -hmm. would find this very metaphysical and say, oh, I'm not going to uh, do that. They might initially, but I, I have a number of clients who are business executives and professionals who, when I suggest to them that, why don't you do a dream on this, and well, you know, okay. <laughs> and then they find the dream is so helpful that they're amazed, and then they will do it. They may not talk to all their buddies about doing it unless they know <laughs> their buddies are sympathetic to it. But they, all you need is one dream that's well interpreted uh, with someone who knows something about it, and people are convinced. And you, you can see that dreams are simply a sophisticated form of thinking where we are more objective while we sleep and more creative while we sleep than when we're awake once you learn the language of your dreams. Mm -hmm. And people Tell me often the, said, you know, you sleep on an idea to get a good idea. Right. Tell me the story about the young woman very quickly. We have just about 30 seconds. The young woman who asked her boyfriend where the, their ah, relationship was going. The woman was having trouble with her boyfriend and asked for a dream and her question was, where is my relationship with George going? Our dreamer's name is Nina. In the dream, George comes up to Nina and says, Nina, would you come with me on a voyage? And she said, well, what's the name of the ship? And he said, it's the Titanic. Oh, no. <laughs> so she should draw her own conclusions she from She needed that. to look exactly. at some of the basic problems Dr. of that relationship. Dr. Loma Flowers, Dr. Gail Delaney, thank you for being with us on Weekday to talk about how I can use my dreams to improve myself, perhaps move further in my career. I'm Ricky Stevenson. Thank you for joining us on Weekday. I lost mine. I, it flew out the window on the way over here. And I, My I word. Went in your dress. Jesse Penny. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> kind of ties my dad I gives me. You know, they say Yahoo, my name is Lou, and things. <laughs> Your father wears a Yahoo? Well, he says, hey, here's some ties you might like to. And you know, these old ties that, no, you know, like this with the thing. And, but this was a Well, then if that's mine, how come that looks so modern? This is one of your shoelaces, Merv. Uh, no, oh, this oh, oh. Actually, this is a nice tie. Thank you very much. Well. <laughs> <laughs> They will, wardrobe is right back here. They will immediately snatch it off your neck. I know, I know. Get. Well, it's only a clip-on, so that's No, it is not a clip-on. <laughs> well, they can just you are really it. a bad guy. How's your mom? I haven't seen her in a while. Mom is good. Mom is doing well. Does well. she know what you do? You know, it's interesting. Just when I think she understands. What business you're in. Yeah, you know, she's, she's been to the show. She's met you. She's right. sat in the audience. And I think now she knows. I was home a couple of months ago, and I hear her on the phone. This is what someone said, apparently, what's Jay doing now? My mother, she said, she says, well, he has a little skit that he puts on from town to town. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm the village idiot. I come in on the train, people wait with pies. There he is. Hey, boy, I'm going to But that's cute. She's out here. Well, they're not out here now. They just went back, but. Yeah. You know, she comes to my house, and she. Cleans. Well, she, I don't mind the cleaning, but she rearranges it like it's her house, you know? Yeah. You know what I'm saying? When your mother comes, I mean, I love how my mother stays, but she does not understand that single men do not save old french fry oil. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? She saves all this stuff in little tins. <laughs> I, I say, Ma, I'm on TV, I'll buy you a new bottle. Well, you never know. You know yeah. I, mean, I, go down, I go down in her 
basement. Right. Oh. You know what I mean? I go down in her basement at home and she's got jars marked bacon fat, 1959. <laughs> what are you gonna do with this stuff? Like, well, you never know. And... <laughs> do you have live-in help? Do I have live-in help? <laughs> what does that mean? Well, uh, does your mother know how to introduce, for example, you Sound like the and your girlfriend? Of the music. Well, my, you know, my mother's from the old school, as they say. Uh, it's like, uh, well, it's true, you know, what do you call people that live together nowadays? I mean, that is a mom, you know. You don't know how to introduce them. Well, roommate sounds kind of stupid if you're an adult. And here in Hollywood, you always hear people say things like, uh, well, this is Larry, my lover, you know. It's great to see Larry running through mist. <laughs> My mom came up with a perfect name. My girlfriend and I were home this summer, you know. My mother was a little embarrassed that, you know, we were living together and whatnot, and she didn't have to introduce us to neighbors. She says, uh, well, this is my son, Jay, and his, um, <coughs> His what? Which is, <coughs> And of course, the other mothers, oh, my son has a, <coughs> <laughs> What are you doing with Como? Are you telling, uh, are you discussing world? problems and situations. Yeah, I like working with him. We have a lot of fun. We have to do a lot of current events. He's a terrific man. Isn't he? Oh, he's a lot of fun. We have a good time with him. We have a good time. With him. Do you make him laugh? Yeah, I like him. He's a, he's he's great. We we have a He's good a good time. audience. Yeah. Oh, he's perfect. He's like Eddie Arnold, you know. Yeah. He's one of those guys that loves a good joke all the time. Uh, do you discuss world situations, for example, when you do a concert or a... Oh, yeah, I think people... We didn't just rush her right so in the weird. back door. It's so right weird. Door. She thinks they are. Well, I'll tell you some weird dreams. Well, you tell her. <laughs> she is a dream psychologist <laughs> who has devised a unique method to dream your problems away. And she's here to tell us all about it. She's got a brand new book called Living Your Dreams. Ladies and gentlemen, would you welcome Dr. Gail Delaney. It's sort of that dream you have, and I have it often. Not we, you have the dream. <laughs> you have, just as you're falling asleep, it's that, that moment, uh, you're either, I was, I'm either driving a car or riding a bicycle, and, I'm, and I just as I start to fall off the bicycle, I wake up with a start, or I think I'm falling asleep at the wheel and wake up with a start. But it's just like the very first few minutes I, I fall asleep. Is that common? Is that a... That is common. The bicycle is special to you. Oh. When I do it, I, I skate and I fall down. What is she fall I mean, down. That's my way of waking up with this jolt. Some people fall down steps. But many, many people, especially after 10 stay, will have that jolt to wake It's like losing control of, of what's going on. And you suddenly recognize it. <laughs> Watch this. Do you dream in color or black and white? Uh, William Blinn has a... Um, Festival every year called the Last night I had a dream in color. That means you remembered it well. Yes, a very vivid dream. Yeah. Very vivid. Now I'm going to throw you a really odd one. I do not remember my dreams in America. I don't remember them. I can't tell you my last dream. I was over in Europe. I dreamed every night. Why, doctor? <laughs> Does your sleep schedule change when you're in Europe? Oh, yeah. And Linguini. <laughs> and you're more relaxed. Very. That's the difference. You have to have a moment or two when you wake up to think backwards, to let the dream thoughts, which are more subtle, float into your mind. If you're every day, boy, I'm going to wake up and do my show today, and I've got to get out and do that, the minute you think that thought, or if you even think I have to get up and have my coffee, the dreams go away for most people. Yeah, see, I don't remember any of them here. And they were really great. I dreamt about everybody back here. Uh -huh. <laughs> it was cheaper than making a phone call. <laughs> The other thing is that I wanted, what was it? I had a really good one I wanted to ask. Uh, dreams are never predictory. Sometimes they are. Oh. But it's very rare. You mean like, very rare. don't go up in that plane, I dreamed. Usually dreams that we have where our plane is going to crash has to do with our personal life. Something that is like a plane in our life is going to crash. It's not the actual plane. We're using the plane as a symbol for some part of our life where we think we're flying high and then zoop. Now, the most obvious examples, like, um, um, oh, like if you dream all the time your teeth or your hair or something is falling out, you're afraid of your masculinity. Or if you feel it, you're jumping up and down all the time, you're afraid of something. All that kind okay, of stuff. Okay, just to show you that those <laughs> pat answers for if you dream this, then that means that. Well, that's it's not what I true. read in the dream book. Madeline 
has dreams of teeth falling out. Now, she's not worried about her masculinity. She's worried about her teeth falling out. Yeah, she's worried about something else, and she's using her dreams to talk about that problem with herself while she's sleeping. And Do you see yourself with just the gum going? No, I, I feel it, and I wake up in the morning, and, and it takes me about 30 seconds before I feel secure that they're still there. I still feel the pain and everything. They fall out in all different shapes and sizes and gruesome ways, get knocked out, deteriorate them. I wouldn't even discuss that. If <laughs> our meanings of our dreams and the images, well, we may share images. Many of us dream about teeth falling out or airplane crashes. It's different for each person according to your life situation. When you go to sleep at night, you're working on a problem somewhere in your life that isn't working out. You haven't understood it. Your dreams are trying to use all of your memory banks, all of your intuition to help you solve the problem. And what's the image that they use? They use the images of life experience. And all of us share very similar life experience. We all have teeth. We all know about airplanes but we'll use them differently. Very interesting. We'll come back after this commercial message. Let's talk about, can you incubate a dream to be used in order to stop, uh, well, for example, to stop smoking? Okay, yes, you can. And depending upon how well you take the message from your dream, you will stop smoking or you'll do a little bit better with it or you'll ignore the dream message. Okay, you're free to try to incubate a dream tonight, Merv. About the how dream do you of incubate smoking. a dream? And you can also ignore the dream. <laughs> okay, what you do to incubate a dream is you choose a problem that's existing somewhere in your life. For you, it's going to be smoking. Right. And you take a piece of paper and you write down a question or a request that you want your dream to help you work on. And your question might be, I want a dream to help me stop smoking. You write it down on the piece of paper, and you go to sleep, turn out the light, go to sleep, and say that one line over and over again, like a mantra or a lullaby. And Do you, you put the paper under your, under your pillow? If you want to. <laughs> For the smoke fairy to come? <laughs> wake up in the morning yeah. with a pack of cigarettes. <laughs> or a tooth. <laughs> you or a tooth, your teeth right? Falling out. I'll wake up with Twinkies under my pillow. That's right. <laughs> But you just leave the paper anywhere. You go to sleep, you fall asleep real quickly. If you can help it, you don't take any drugs to go to sleep because by repeating one question over and over, <laughs> Sorry, Jay. you won't need it. You'll get so bored asking this question, I need a dream to help me stop smoking. I need a dream to help me stop smoking. <gasps> you go to sleep very quickly on that. Do you get it? Yeah. What okay. if you're not alone? That could be very embarrassing. So All right. You <laughs> just change it. We need a dream to stop smoking. Smoking. <laughs> Shut up. Jay, you just uh, uh, say it to yourself. Oh, <laughs> okay. The next morning, you'll wake up with a dream. And you write that down very quickly. Go and have your coffee, have breakfast. Then come back and look at your dream as if it were a parable. And it will be a dream that will help you to stop smoking. Let me give you an example of a woman who did this. She went to sleep, I need a dream that will help me stop smoking. And she woke up with a dream where one of her close friends who had died from cancer came to her. Hmm. and said, do you know what you're doing to your body? Do you know? Think about your lungs, think about your son. How is he going to feel when you're old and dying of emphysema? And you're doing this to him, too. Well, God, she got... I feel wonderful she now. She felt... <laughs> I don't need the dream now. <laughs> she didn't need any more. For her, that was enough when she woke up that what she knew consciously before she went to bed was that smoking's not good for you, she shouldn't do it, her friends told her. But the dream hit her on such an emotional level that she stopped smoking. Now she can't sleep. Right. Uh. <laughs> Did you ever hear of anybody that gets up exhausted because they keep dreaming they're awake? Is that possible? You're yes. Huh? You no, that you would yourself dream, yourself. yeah, that you're awake. Yeah. And you wake up exhausted like you haven't had any sleep. Isn't that awful? Luckily, it doesn't happen very often, and it usually happens when you're very uptight about something in your life. Right. And you just have to weather those nights. Mm. There's no Anybody want to check a dream, check a dream, check a dream, check a dream? <laughs> it's a new game show. You got a dream, <laughs> Jay? I don't know. My dreams are all Keep them clean. Pretty. Oh, well, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm... Uh, Dead, huh? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just keep seeing these leather thongs. No. Oh, no. <laughs> Anybody have a dream they have all the time and can't get rid of it? Yes, madam. I always dream about cats attacking me and biting on my hands, and I feel it. And I'm deathly afraid of cats. So you're afraid of cats now? No, I was before. Oh. But I have this dream, and it reoccurs. How frequently does it reoccur? 
Are you having it now? <laughs> um, once every, a month? No, every few months, sometimes more often, sometimes less. And for how many years has this been going on? Since I was a kid, about oh. high school age. Okay, now, nightmares are your most important dreams. They're the dreams that are saying there's this big problem and you have not yet figured it out. The dream's trying to show you what's going on. Now, since you've been having it since childhood, I would guess that it's some problem or conflict you've had since childhood. And you have to go back into your head as a little kid and describe a cat. What is a cat? What are they like? You might want to do this, shall we do it now, or do you want to do it in your mind? Do you want, why don't you just tell me, what's a cat? Pretend I've never seen one before, okay? What is a cat like? It's an animal with claws. <laughs> okay, is it, is it like a tiger, big and dangerous? No, because in the dreams, I, I, I attack them back and I, I kill them and I break their necks. <laughs> I'd like that lady arrested. <laughs> well, you know, there are terrible fears in bed of a cat. In the old days, parents used to say, if there's a cat in bed with you, in the middle of the night, it will, remember, it would cut off your breathing smother, or something. Yes. It will smother you, and the hairs will go up your nose and you're dead. <laughs> and that, did your mother ever tell you that? No. Oh. Well. What you want to do with this dream is, you can say, tonight, I'd like to have the cat dream again, OK? And go to sleep saying, I want that terrifying cat dream again. And this time, when I see the cats, I'm not going to kill them because they'll always pop up in your dreams again. You can't kill off the enemy in your dream. You, they'll always come back. Instead, say to the cat, what do you want? And it sounds crazy, but in the dream, the cat will talk to you, and the cat will tell you what it represents for you. you that's the easiest way to figure out a, a recurring nightmare like that. Okay. You better Thank have you. back on the show to tell you how it all works. Right, good. yeah, I know. And I heard you out of the corner of my ear here saying, Madeline said to stop my teeth from falling out in my dreams, she's going to have them all pulled. <laughs> there won't be anything to fall out, right? I don't think that's so good a solution. She has such beautiful teeth. I know they are. Well, that's how why about, she's afraid. How about talking in your sleep? I do that all the time. But I don't, I'll, I mean, I'll be sleeping and, uh, you know, uh, I'll say, pass the ketchup. I mean, I won't say anything, you know, like, uh, just, just talking. What causes that when you're talking in your sleep? Well, if you could get your <clears throat> to wake you up right at the end of that dream. <laughs> get your <clears throat> I meant when I was at my mom's house. Oh. <laughs> when I'm staying with my mom and dad and they're in the next room and they hear me talking, they should come in and wake me up. Either that or they can question you and you'll answer. Well, that, does that work? Can people well, that's the thing. That's fun. You ask someone who's watch, listening to you speak, have them ask you questions. What's going on in your dream right now? And if you don't respond to them, have them or her or him or whatever it's wait. It's not him. 